Today on X Play, we investigate why Sherlock Holmes is so hot. What a breathtaking man. And does Forza Horizon 5 have the broad appeal to set a new personal best for the series? We head to sunny Mexico to find out. It's game time. Hello and welcome to X Play. Our next review helps us solve a crime. Who is the greatest detective of all time and beloved the world over? Batman. Mm, yes, but this game's about Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that's disappointing. But what if he was a hot, young Sherlock Holmes? That, that's just confusing and unnecessary. Now nah, you get it. Check out our X-Play review. Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 is far from the first Sherlock Holmes video game. Since 2002, developer Frogwares has taken on the intrepid investigator's mantle and has delivered eight different Holmes adventures, ranging from encounters with Jack the Ripper and Arsène Lupin to even adopting a daughter. The Devil's Daughter! But Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, the ninth edition of Frogwares series, is actually the first game chronologically and features the first open world for the detective. But this isn't your lip, Professor Sherlock Holmes. No, this is hot Sherlock Holmes. He's young. He wears just one of his sleeves rolled up because he's kind of a bad boy. Oh, yeah. And he's a coroner's bag of mental health issues, including having an imaginary friend-brother companion coincidentally named John. He's single and ready to mingle, around a crime scene, that is. Whoa, what a breathtaking man. Of course, here at the very prestigious X-Play Gamer Labs, we had to conduct our own investigative tests surrounding this Sherlock. Right now, Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 sits pretty high on the Hunklock Holmes tier list, with Herlock Sholmes still sitting solely at S tier. Why are all the Sherlocks so hot? Even the animal ones. That's a mystery for another X-Play. But not only is this Sherlock a babe of Baker Street, but he also comes with a customizable wardrobe. You heard that right. You can dress up Sherlock Holmes. Night on the town, Sherlock. Clean cut and ready for combat Joker from Persona 5. Sultry sailor. Abe Lincoln for you history lovers. Whatever floats your boat, I guess. But these outfits serve a purpose outside of just entertainment. Well, all except John's ice cream parlor getup. Sherlock Holmes, outfits, makeup, hats, and yes, facial hair are all pivotal throughout your journey. Some mysteries may have you dressing as a described culprit. Meanwhile, in order to access unique areas or information from locals, you'll have to dress the part. As in, don't dress as a polished Victorian bad boy who looks like he could start his own boy band called the Industrial Revolution. The multifaceted wardrobe system provides a creative and fun tool to the the game's overall investigative gameplay, which provides me with a stylish segue into discussing the game's core. Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 is a refreshing take on the mystery genre. Having played my life's worth of puzzle investigation and mystery adventure titles, going into Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, I felt confident about what I was in for. And boy was I wrong, but in the best way. The overarching mystery of Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 is, well, you. Sherlock is unable to recall his early life on Cordona, and after visiting his mother's grave, there appear to be questions surrounding her death that you do not know the answers to. Questions that lead you all over the island in search of clarity. Alongside John, you are tasked with solving crimes and mysteries in order to unlock more of your memories and the riddles that lie within your past. But Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 does not hold your hand or spoon feed you these mysteries. No, Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 pushes you out of the nest and simply yells, good luck, on your way down. As Sherlock, not only do you utilize specific game features to solve mysteries, the Mind Palace, Casebook, Chemical Analysis, Camera, etc., but you must also use your own brain. Yes, I'm talking to you, audience. Yours. Your brain. Quest locations are never marked on the map, so you have to use the power of reading and looking up street names to decipher where you need to go in the game. And the same goes for inspecting police records or exploring the newspaper archive. You have to utilize the context clues from your own casebook in order to find the information you're looking for. While yes, this can sometimes lead to frustrating moments of not knowing where to go next, when you ultimately find that next clue or figure out the next location, you are hit with a sensation so strong you may be yelling, the game is afoot! at your own console. Likewise, the mysteries you take on in this title are not on an unmovable linear track. Many games in the genre, including Phoenix Wright, Professor Layton, and even Nancy Drew, usually feature mysteries you need to solve in one very specific way. 
In Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, you have the option to accuse more than one suspect, in addition to ultimately making the decision to arrest an individual, in some cases an elephant, or simply let them go. The game doesn't correct you if you've made the wrong decision. It simply lets you live with that choice. This makes every deduction that much harder, but also that much more important. As Sherlock, I simply had to trust my gut and go where I thought the evidence was leading me. And this even follows you up to the end of the game. There are four different endings for Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, and none of them are truly good or bad. They are each heartbreaking in their own way and have different impacts on Sherlock's life and outlook, even down to which character narrates them. Each mystery and side quest was unique in its own way, which kept me constantly intrigued with what I was doing. And Sherlock's overly casual crime scene reconstruction reclining stances gave me a good laugh. Okay, Sherlock just casually lay down on the floor of the crime scene. That's definitely a good idea. Overall, Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1's greatest triumph is its investigative gameplay. The game treats its players like the intellectual free thinkers they are and provides a variety of paths for a genre that is traditionally one track only. Now, the setting is sadly a different story. This title takes a bold step in game design and puts itself into the sprawling open world of Cordona. But sadly, this endeavor is half-baked, or rather half-lit pipe in the hands of the world's most infamous detective. Cordona features a variety of districts ranging from metropolitan British squares to crowded Mediterranean markets. But across all these districts, there's no real life in Cordona. Yes, there are shops and areas that you can access, including newsstands, furniture stores, and designated quest buildings. But overall, Cordona feels more like a shell than a real city. Nowadays, open world games have evolved into highly detailed experiences. You can play cards at a local inn, explore homes for materials and individuals to assassinate. You can even purchase cheese and pomade at a general store. You get my point. If you're going to create an open world game, you have to fill it with a plethora of experiences, side quests, or locations for the player to explore. Or even just engaging NPCs, which this game lacks as well, to the point where during the first part of the game, I literally heard NPCs doing some weird fake mumbling voiceover than actual speaking. <laughs> Moreover, you can only fast travel and take carriages to discovered areas on the map. So get ready to run your way across an entire city early on in the game in order to discover all of the fast travel points that you'll rely on later. And when I say run, I truly mean run. One weird plus to this game is that Sherlock Holmes does not have a stamina meter, which means he can just infinitely run and never stop. Speaking of unlimited stamina, there is another feature that Sherlock has an unlimited amount of. It's not wit or sex appeal, it's ammo for his gun. In this iteration of Sherlock Holmes, his solution to every combat situation is gun. I'm not kidding. Disarm your enemies with a gun. Take down powerful baddies by removing their armor with a gun. Use the environment around you to get the upper hand in battle with a f***ing gun. Someone call the NRA. I think we just found them a new spokesperson. Look, there's a part of me that does appreciate the disarming and cleverly use your setting aspects of the game, but it just feels very rigid. And when you can only do those actions with a gun and not anything else, at least let me do something with my hands, like in the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock movie. <laughs> Combat is largely repetitive in this game. Every combat sequence is set within a specifically sized square with a very specific multi-shot setup cutscene and NPCs that all shout the same exact phrase over and over. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. I'm coming. This makes combat the least fun and least rewarding part of Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, which is disheartening because it's one of the fastest ways to earn money so that you can buy back the auction furniture of your childhood and fill out your closet with outfits like this. While there is a lot Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1 gets right, ultimately, its hollow open world and lackluster combat leave the game feeling more like a novelette than a sprawling epic. If you are a fan of mystery adventure games and are looking for a new challenge, then I would definitely recommend stepping into to the sexy shoes of this young Sherlock Holmes. However, if you're looking for something more, you may not fully find it within the sea splash walls of Cordona, which is why we're giving Sherlock Holmes chapter one a three out of five. Mystery solved. The Sherlock Holmes game is fine, but the real mystery is what does X play have in store for you after the break? Forza, we've got a review of Forza. Come on back after this. Five breadsticks. Four my 
triple treat. Three layers deep. Ten Cinnabon mini rolls to eat. And the pizza plus another pizza. The triple treat box, only from Pizza Hut. What's the recipe for surprising the kids, treating yourself, and ditching dish duty? You're looking at it. Order your Pizza Hut faves like original pan, original stuffed crust, and more at PizzaHut.com. No one out pizzas the hut. Welcome back to X-Play. Forza Horizon 5 was not nominated for any categories in the Game Awards. But it did get an X-Play review, which is almost as good. Let's head to Mexico and meet some British people. Check it out. Unlike racing titles that put you on a track mostly turning left, this is an open world sandbox that lets players figure out where and how they want to drive. With its cutting edge physics, detailed tuning system, and ridiculously large catalog of cars all wrapped in a gorgeous package, the Forza Horizon series is an exceptionally easy entry point for racing fans across the spectrum. Whether they want to launch vehicles at 200 miles per hour off a volcano, or spend six hours designing a car decal before accidentally fat fingering the cancel button, it has something for everyone. That sounds oddly specific for us. The devil's in the decals, Adam. Now before I really drive into this, I wanna talk about my review experience. In the pissing contest between Sony's Gran Turismo and Xbox's Forza, Xbox won my heart long ago with its ease of access for Forza on PC. I wanna specifically call this out because it informs part of my review. Now where I've struggled to acquire any of the next-gen consoles and I refuse to support a scalper's market, I scored big on securing the latest graphics cards and a solid PC. And so, like any true obnoxious PC gamer, my eyes have been blessed with the beauty and technical marvel that fans have come to expect from these titles. Now the disclaimer is that if you're driving around in the graphic card equivalent of a 1997 Honda Civic, your graphic mileage will vary compared to my experience in this video because my PCs are Ferrari. Likewise, because my wife won't indulge me in turning our living room into a cockpit, I also played Forza Horizon 5 exclusively on an Xbox controller, not a wheel. I will say though that I've heard anecdotes from wheel enthusiasts that this Horizon plays better on a wheel than previous installments. With the housekeeping out of the way, how does this game stack up to the others in the series? Room, room, beep, beep, motherfuckers, let's go. There's a lot to love about this game, from its beautiful graphics to its Jalen on garage of cars available for endless tinkering, and of course, the complete freedom on the map. And as far as gameplay goes, all the Horizon staples are still intact for good and for ill. You've got your barns with rare cars that you can collect and fix up. You've got your categorized race types, your mindless collectibles, your RPG-like perk systems, and your terrible crowds and narrative. Just kidding. And hang on. <laughs> Understood. 
but we'll get back to that in a minute. The open world has a good amount of freedom, but it can also feel like a prison. It's sizable, so to incentivize you to really explore this game, it litters your GPS with a scattering of random billboards, hidden barns full of rare cars for you to find, and challenges like driving off a cliff at full speed. It's like the end of Thelma and Louise, except you live and your car lands with barely a scratch. I found myself consciously overwhelmed with the amount of shit I had to collect. And yeah, I realize I'm complaining about having too much game to play, but there's a balance here between satisfying expansive gameplay and doing quests for the sake of doing quests or collecting more cars than you even know what to do with. What am I ever gonna do with this van? One positive about exploring the map is the scenery. The beautiful Mexican landscapes available to you include all the terrain types you would ever want. It has not one, but two scenic beach stretches, just for vibing. And the seasons change each week, which you'll be familiar with if you played Horizon 4. But in this game, the season changes bring new weather events like dust storms and flooded areas of the map. So you too can experience devastating climate events in your racing video game. The Marshall Islands are literally disappearing underwater. Can we get our shit together? It's very clear that a lot of hard work went into making the environments, the customization, and the collectibles. It's also very clear that no work was done on the narrative. The main campaign has you competing in circuits and exploring the beauty that is Mexico. And it is beautiful. But if this is a game about exploring a new country and its culture, why the f is everyone in this game from the UK? I believe this is yours. How was your flight? Not bad. Exit procedure was a bit rough. Keep it up, superstar. It can help you explore Mexico and find fun things to do. In the first few hours of playing, I came across only two Mexican characters. But while there's not as much attention to representing Mexico beyond just the landscapes, the main characters you interact with are women of different backgrounds. And it's nice to see that in a racing game or any video game for that matter. I also want to give a little shout out to the character creation. It's not as robust as you get with an RPG, obviously, but the options to add prosthetic limbs, choose your character's pronouns, and how you choose to represent yourself in the game, regardless of gender, is a thoughtful and meaningful touch. This is something that more games should start implementing in their character creation menus. Because if a car game can do it, games with literally role-playing in their genre title should be a no-brainer. When Horizon is at its best is when you're comfortable enough with the UI to get to the stuff that you actually want to do. For me, it's getting as close to the world of sim racing that I can on the easiest entry point. And that might take some time because this game isn't exactly newbie friendly. There's not much of a tutorial, it flashes the control scheme up on the screen for five seconds before dropping a car off a plane and letting you have at it. which is a really cool opening sequence. If you're already familiar with the racing game physics, then this shouldn't be a problem for you. If you're not, there's definitely a learning curve here with no options for tutorials on how to drift, the best ways to tune your car, or how to best avoid crashing into someone's house. So if you're looking for more handholding, I would look outside the game for tips and tricks. But what Horizon does offer are a vast array of difficulty setting adjustments and lots and lots of customization for your driving experiences. This game is a mecca for those of us who want to customize every inch of our cars down to the brake pads. That's right, Horizon 2 fans rejoice because finding the perfect accent color for your brake pads is back. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm f***ing stoked about painting brake pads. And beyond cosmetic enhancements for your car, there's a new and improved tuning system, letting you really get into the nitty gritty of how your ride performs. The biggest improvement here is the days of the Horizon series forcing you to only run those ugly ass Forza body kits to acquire downforce tuning are gone. What do you think, Adam? I I have no idea what you just said. Did you hear me try to explain what shifting was earlier? You'll learn. Anyway, other notable changes to the system for Horizon 5 are multiple Horizon Festival locations. You guys, there's an actual circuit track in this game, not just that one drag racing strip. You know the one. You can also create your own game modes using the event labs, which you can find me at 2 a.m. perfecting the best course to get the most out of my beautiful new brake pads. And one of the biggest issues I had with Horizon 4 was the lack of road type and general landscape stretch that felt enjoyable for cruising in my preferred driving style. With Horizon 5's larger map and terrain diversity, you can find any location wanted for your current itch. Personally, I'm a big drifting fan and love the volcanic curved road spending most of my time in the mountains pretending this was Horizon Japan. Speaking of, what, what country is this again? Sit back and, well, tour across Mexico. Forza Horizon 5 has so much content to get through, even if a lot of it is empty calories, but credit to the fact that it offers such a wide spectrum of experiences. That just makes it hard to really pinpoint exactly what your car kink is. But once you find it, Forza Horizon 5 perfects what the predecessors have already built. With some quality of life adjustments as a cherry on top, Horizon 5 isn't going to reinvent the wheel. 
But if you've never been a Forza fan before, now would be the literal best time to jump in and drive around all of those places we can't visit in our current pandemic locked hellscape. With the addition of Game Pass and a year crowded with god tier releases like Halo and other AAA action titles, Forza Horizon is in a perfect spot to get picked up by unassuming race enthusiasts without the investment of $70 to $100. If you haven't tried it, I strongly urge you to get that road rage out and meet me on the streets of Mexico with all these British people. Okay, you know what, Frost? I think I might give this game the green light. Get it? Yes, I get it. Car jokes. We've got lots more show. After the break, we've got an inside look at the campaign of Call of Duty Vanguard. We'll be right back. Hi! Thanks for joining the Pain Motors quarterly earnings call. And now I'll turn you over to our new CEO. The numbers last quarter were rough. Mia culpa. <laughs> well, not Mia culpa, actually. They a culpa. Let's sell the crap out of this car. It looks like the car was assembled by a spider on LSD who also had bad taste. It, it, it tested well. American Auto premieres January 4th on NBC and watch two episodes now on Peacock. <laughs> Chucky will return. Welcome home. Until then, watch the hit series from the beginning, streaming now on Peacock. <laughs> Welcome back! The Call of Duty Vanguard campaign takes a whole nine minutes to complete. It's incredible how much history they packed into those minutes. I, I don't think that's true. The campaign's longer than that. You're right! It's at least as long as an episode of X-Play. The Vanguard campaign features unique stories from World War II history. Adam talked with the writers to learn how to connect gamers with these moments of heroism. I am fortunate enough to not be joined by one, but by two narrative designers on the single player for Call of Duty Vanguard. I am so happy to introduce Belinda Garcia and Alexa Ray Correa. Yeah, we're honored and excited. <laughs> we're so excited. Thank you for having us. Narrative first person shooter, there, 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 there seem to be fewer and fewer. And so this one obviously stands out. As someone who's quite a fan of that, this one stands out for, for something like that. And I really would love to hear from you is what's What's unique about that storytelling than something that's maybe a little bit more obvious in a role-playing game where it really does sort of stop down and tells a lot of story before the action starts? So the thing about first person anything really is you're allowing the player to sort of sit back and become the character like they look down and it's their hands they're interacting like they're not really seeing themselves so you have to craft a story and also dialogue and everything else around it in a way that the player feels comfortable in that skin and there's and there's nothing that sort of disassociates them from it or creates like a like a, a, a separation if you will and I think having a first person for this particular story we're trying to tell is really interesting because we're trying to tell stories that maybe have not been told before like we really go through fronts of the war that haven't really been explored in video games we want to tell the stories of people in places that may have been forgotten to time that aren't talked about as much and I so I think putting people in the driver's seat for this was the best way to tell it because it really lets them get a front row seat to all of that 
I think a lot, especially in the American perception, uh, when you think of World War II, it's the Western European and the Pacific fronts that you know kind of stand front of mind because some of the American troops were, were fighting in those areas. Uh, but you worked on the Eastern Front, and obviously the game also covers what happened in North Africa, which were not minor elements to this war whatsoever. But I'm really curious what it was like to be able to sort of represent an aspect of the war that doesn't... That, that, that I don't think lives in the popular imagination to the same extent as, say, the Battle of Midway or something like that. Yeah, so I, I did work on Stalingrad, so I did work a lot on uh, Paulina Petrova, the, the Russian sniper lady. Our writer, Sam Mags, laid this incredible groundwork for this character, and I was able to go into the campaign and, and flesh her out and, you know, do her gameplay dialogue. As far as, you know, diversity, we're also talking about, you know, people that fought in the war that, you know, didn't want to fight in the war. You know, they are regular people. They are people at home that, you know, were just living regular lives and then the war happened and they had to rise to the occasion. Uh, Paulina is one of those people. You know, she, when the war started, she was a nurse, but she wanted to fight. You know, she had this fire inside of her and it, 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 made her want to be on the battlefield and once the the invasion of stalingrad happened she was able to you know sort of rise to that reputation there is a sense of diversity not just gender but uh the color um mm -hmm. and, and 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 just to kind of clarify one thing this is not taking a fictional liberty this is based on fact that were women and people of color that fought in world war ii am i right you are right absolutely there, done we're <laughs> done with that we're not talking about that one anymore <laughs> <laughs> people forget that it was a world war. It, it happened all over the world and not just on battlefronts, but at home and, and you know, young people, old people, people that fought in World War I that also fought in World War II, you know, there's so many people, so many perspectives that we were able to, you know, dip into. Obviously there's way more than we can cover in our game and in our live seasons. But, you know, we were so excited because, you know, all of these people were brave. All of these people were incredible and not all their stories have been highlighted in media. And we got the chance to, you know, listen and 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 learn about all of these different perspectives. And, you know, one that's really special is Daniel, who is part of our ship roster. Um, he is Japanese American and he was actually put into you know, camps, you know, in America, and then America conscripted him into the war and sent him to fight for America, which is, you know, you talk about World War II, and like you said, you know, you know, great American, all American, you know, all of that during World War II, and you forget that there were people, there were immigrants in America at that time that weren't treated like Americans. And that those Japanese American regiments were some of the most decorated Absolutely. Uh, during the course yeah. of World War II. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, suckle on that irony, kids. <laughs> um, the, it, 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 I, I think the other interesting part is there are a lot of World War II games, and we've kind of seen that ebb and flow, and I think there's always that sense of, is there more? Oh, 100%. I really think people are going to learn from Vanguard. I think they're going to be surprised, delighted, shocked. I think they're going to have questions. I think it's going to send people, you know, looking stuff up, thinking, talking about it. I really hope it does. I think it would inspire people to to look into history and things like that. And I think there's also, I, I, I get the sense that this is probably one of the most successful ways to try to kind of keep these histories alive or finally be able to tell the histories that never made it into part of the the, the lore of history uh, for, for, for so many decades. But Belinda, am I, am I just being too hopeful here? No, yeah, what really we really wanted to do with Vanguard is make sure that everyone can see themselves in someone. Um, and I feel really proud about all the work that we did. Our our entire writing team, our writing team is diverse and we, you know, made sure that we told the stories that we, you know, we want to tell and we know that people want to see that they never have heard of, you know, there's you know, you don't hear a lot about female pilots during the war, but there were a ton of them and 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 black pilots. And it's just incredible. It's just so many people, so many people. There's so many stories um, that we definitely weren't like didn't have a game big enough to touch, but we did our very, very best. What a great episode of X-Play. Did we solve it? The mystery? Uh, yeah. Don't tell me, they were stabbed with an icicle that's melted and that's why there was no murder weapon? Where is this coming from again? I subscribe to one of those things where they send you a new box with a new mystery in it every month. This is the widest thing that I've ever heard. The pandemic did weird things to us all. Uh, this feels like the perfect time to end the episode, uh, so yeah, thanks for watching. Bye! Peace.
Now seriously, yeah. I would give you a new box, a new thing, get it in, it has this the knife, the blood's on it. This is as white as this fit I got on, oh my lord.